like to welcome you, comrade. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, comrades. Um, my presentation is going to be um, using a slideshow. So um, I think if Dennis starts, okay, there we go. So if we start on the the first one, um, sorry, the, the second one, I should say. Um, this is a, a direct uh, quotation from our party's last Congress uh, resolution, um, which rather uh, correctly is called Halting Imperialism's Drive to War, where we make out the case for opposing British policy in relation to China, uh, specifically in relation to the militarization of the South China Sea, um, and also in relation to Hong Kong, which obviously has particular colonial uh, connection with um, the British state. Uh, if we go to the next one. Um, one of the things which to follow on from Duncan's points about Taiwan, it's, it's really understated just how important China's legacy as a country divided and carved up by various uh, colonial and imperialist powers, mostly European ones, but also, of course, uh, Japan. Um, many people perhaps think that um, the colonial legacy in China was only based in, in Hong Kong. They perhaps forget Macau entirely, which was a Portuguese territory. Um, but also the colonial powers that established a system of treaty ports uh, dotted across China, which were um, essentially enclaves of colonial powers where the Chinese had no real sovereignty over their own cities, their own ports. Um, the number of countries that had those treaty ports is actually quite uh, surprisingly large. It includes the United States, France, um, uh, Imperial Germany and so on. So this is a, a, a factor which is important to understand why China has been so uh, incredibly focused on uh, asserting its sovereignty over its own territory. Uh, if we go to the next one. Now, British imperial and colonial history is little known, too little known in, in Britain itself. It's perhaps better known in other places, uh, but it's not just historical. Uh, one of the factors that we are seeing with the current uh, Boris Johnson administration, or whether or not he lasts, is a, a turn towards um, a recovery, a recuperation of Britain's overseas roles and overseas bases, including uh, the floating of the idea of re-establishing military bases in um, the South uh, China Sea. Uh, next one. Um, we focus naturally on the most powerful imperialist power in the world, which is the United States, but it's important, I think, sometimes to look at the secondary powers, and Britain is a very, very powerful player um, in fact, um, too often, I think we on the left, including in the British left, uh, tend to um, ridicule uh, Britain's pretensions, which is perhaps fair enough, but we ignore some very important features. Um, firstly, of course, Britain is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which gives it a veto over uh, many areas of, of UN policy. Uh, secondly, Although it's a declining uh, economy, it still has roughly around $3 trillion in terms of GDP, US dollars, and as a member of the, the G7. As a military power, although Britain does not have a, a huge standing military force, it's something like the, uh, not even in the top 30, in actual fact, its military budget is uh, estimated to be the fourth largest military budget in the world. And obviously it was also a founder member of NATO. Uh, critically for this discussion, uh, Britain is a nuclear weapons power. Um, its Trident nuclear submarine fleet is due to be expanded and the Tories have uh, said from a review last year 
that Britain's nuclear arsenal will actually actually be expanded as well. So there'll be an increased number of warheads. This is incredibly dangerous um, and goes against all um, signed treaties on things like the, the non-proliferation treaty, for example. So it's an extremely dangerous trend toward militarization. Uh, another often overlooked area is the arms industry. When we, we use the term military industrial complex, we naturally think of um, Eisenhower's references to the United States. But in fact, Britain also has its own military industrial complex. It's the second largest exporter of military hardware globally, um, mostly in the areas of uh, jet fighters and aviation. Uh, but it's a, an extremely uh, important part of the British economy. And it's one of the few areas of manufacturing uh, that wasn't uh, completely destroyed during the, the Thatcher uh, era, era in the, the 80s and into the, into the 90s. So this is a very, very important lobbying sector within the British uh, ruling class. And the final point is that um, James Bond, not with, notwithstanding, Britain's intelligence services are a key component uh, both of NATO and also of the Five Eyes um, intelligence sharing community, that is the, the five eyes being the, the Anglophone uh, countries. So this is a very important factor. So Britain really is an extremely dangerous threat to peace on its own. Um, the fact that we're seeing at the moment uh, a very uh, clear pivot by the Johnson administration to act as the henchman of Biden and, and US imperialism is, um, is something that shouldn't hide the fact that Britain has considerable power on its own. It's a, a, a significant imperialist power. Uh, next one. Uh, and again, next. So this is the, uh, the review I was talking about. It was published uh, last year in March and it commits to increasing Britain's nuclear warheads from the current 200 to 260. Uh, also quite dangerous in respect to the shift in strategy because the Tories are now saying that nuclear weapons could be used in response, not just to um, nuclear threats or conventional uh, threats, but also emerging technologies which uh, could be taken to mean uh, cyber attacks or something of the nature. The re-equipment of the Trident fleet, there are four Trident submarines and the British campaign for nuclear disarmament has estimated that this will cost at least 205 billion pounds. Um, to pick up a point made by, um, by Vinnie earlier about the, the uh, waste of the armaments and industry, £205 billion pounds would pay for 120 new hospitals in Britain. So that gives you an idea of the ruling classes uh, sense priorities. And this figure actually also includes renting the Trident missiles. The missiles aren't actually owned by Britain, they're owned by the United States. And this is a, another thing which is often um, missed out when people talk about Britain's independent deterrent in actual fact, the Trident system has always been entirely dependent on the United States. Um, I should also say in relation to that, that the, the, the nuclear reactors for the Trident uh, submarines are actually built in Britain. They're built by uh, the Rolls-Royce um, plant in, in Derby. And the new generation of Trident will have a new nuclear reactor, the PWR3. And this has actually been suggested that this will be the nuclear reactor that will be used in the Australian nuclear powered submarines. So clearly Britain and Rolls-Royce in particular are very keen for this um, thing to go forward uh, and hope to get um, uh, a cut of the, um, of, the, of the budget. Next one, please. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Hong Kong. Um, simply because for those of us um, reading the English language press or English language media, you'll know that there's been enormous campaigns uh, on Hong Kong, um, just as there have been over uh, Tibet and Xinjiang. 
Um, the Opium Wars brought Hong Kong into the British Empire. And as I said, the Opium Wars were then used to extend the presence of not just British, but other colonial powers into China. And one of the factors that has happened since the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty in 1997 has been the establishment and the consolidation of a pro-Western, we could say an increasingly pro-Washington, but traditionally pro-London opposition. Um, here you see Nathan Law, who's a wanted man in Hong Kong, um, standing alongside Chris Patton, the last unelected uh, colonial governor, and Priti Patel, probably one of the most poisonous Tory uh, government ministers. Next one, please. <coughs> Nothing. And again, the presentation in, in Western media was of a democratic, peaceful protesters up against uh, uh, police machinery that was um, intent on beating them down. In actual fact, the level of violence in Hong Kong was quite uh, astonishing. The, the biggest level of violence in political terms since the, the late 1960s. Um, it was often said that the leadership of the, the movement was, was non-existent, that it was a spontaneous uh, movement. It was a leaderless movement. Um, but in fact, what was quite clear was the deliberate targeting of any offices of trade unions or political parties which support the One China policy. Um, this, these are photographs taken from uh, one of the uh, M, uh, yeah, MP, the LegCo member, uh, Alice Mack, and the attacks on the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, which is the largest trade union uh, federation in, in Hong Kong. Uh, these got almost no traction, no coverage whatsoever in uh, Western media. Uh, Alice's, um, I interviewed her for the Morning Star, Alice's office was actually attacked and trashed uh, six times. And um, I, I should also point out that in a, in a, a different um, incident, uh, there was actually an assassination attempt on one of the um, One China uh, electoral candidates who was stabbed in broad, broad daylight. Again, absolutely no coverage in Western media. Uh, next one, please. The extent of the collusion between um, the <clears throat> so-called pandemic, excuse me a second, I'll have to. The extent of the collusion between the pandemocratic groups and US imperialism uh, was not even a secret. It shouldn't be a secret to anybody that this was a, a very high profile um, a collusion. Um, it's not just a matter of national endowment for democracy, funds and money going into to, uh, countries. It's also the, the fact that it opens the doors to the corridors of power in Washington and Brussels and elsewhere. And you can see here the very close links between um, some of the individuals, the, the, the man in the bottom left-hand corner is Jimmy Lai, uh, often described as the uh, pro-democracy mogul. He's basically Hong Kong's Rupert Murdoch. Um, his newspapers and websites were utterly poisonous uh, against um, uh, and xenophobic against mainland Chinese. He's a right-wing uh, anti-communist um, without any question. And he himself has historically funded both the uh, Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions leadership, which is the pro-Washington trade union, uh, which has been disbanding itself, uh, and also a number of political figures in Hong Kong. He actually uh, was, was found to have been depositing money in their accounts. And more of this kind of collusion, I think, will be coming out quite soon. Uh, as some of the uh, trials under the national security law happen uh, over the next uh, months. 
Um, and really, this is the, the picture that you need to see to understand why China introduced a national security law in the first place. It was faced with, not to put too fine a point on it, it was faced with a, a fifth column of forces inside Hong Kong that wanted to push the city to the brink, that wanted to bring it to its knees to enforce foreign intervention. They were quite clear about it. Um, Joshua Wong, who is on the top right-hand corner, was absolutely clear that he wanted Trump and the Trump administration to, to intervene. Lai made many remarks about uh, saying how much he'd welcome see more CIA intervention in Hong Kong. And uh, he was a very, very strong supporter of Trump and, and wasn't too happy when, when Biden won. But in terms of their politics, Biden and Trump's pol policies towards Hong Kong seem um, uh, interchangeable. Uh, next one. Um, I mentioned the treaty ports earlier as a, as a means of um, colonialism and imperialism uh, taking control, creating enclaves of power within um, Chinese ports and cities. The Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which was supported by the likes of Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz and, and others, actually makes this very, very clear. Um, I think because of time, I won't read all this out, but the key points are that this was a, a, a law which was designed to allow the United States to control the port and trade of Hong Kong. Uh, and clearly that's something that is uh, completely unacceptable to any sovereign state. Uh, comments, I think uh, I've only got one slide left. And that is to thank uh, our Australian comrades for this really excellent initiative. Um, I think this is something that we should do more and more often. Unfortunately, it's becoming a political necessity apart from anything else. Um, but I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here from, uh, from the Philippines, as it turns out. So thank you very much, comrades. Thank you, Comrade Kenny. It is very insightful and really uh, 